So, Shalom Aleichem, everybody. We are now live schmoozing with Avi with our special guests, Sherry Wallach and Broadway star Itai Benson and a dear friend of both Sherry's and mine. So you may be wondering why I look the way I do, and that's because I am coming to you live today from Canvas Films in Fort Lauderdale, where I am actually shooting a movie. Um, speaking of From Hell to Chala, which is the subject of the book and today's schmooze, I've actually just spent the last hmm, 11 hours in a boxcar on my way to Auschwitz. So talk about your hell. Um, we are very happy to be here. We're very excited uh, with our sponsors and we're very grateful. And we're very grateful to all of you who have joined us today for our Tuesday night schmoozing with Avi. So I would like to get right to it and I want to invite you to join us our dear friend, Sherry Wallach. Sherry, why don't you join? There she is. There I am. Hi, Sherry. So, Hi, Avi. So Sherry is a, is, a, is a friend, and we uh, know each other through a mutual friend who um, we remember with love. Uh, his name was Michael Larson, Oliver Scholem. So they rob my lichtigen Ganeden. He should have a bright and beautiful Garden of Eden, a very dear friend of ours both. But Sherry, you actually knew Michael from a very long time ago. Am I right? When yeah, I met Michael when I was 12. We went to high school together. I met him when I was in seventh grade and he was in 11th grade. Wow, wow. And um, I met Michael when I was a young actor in New York back in the 80s. And he worked on a show called The Golden Land. And we became best of friends and we traveled the world together. And uh, it was a very sad, sad time when he passed away. But he did leave us with an enormous legacy and a lot of friends, including our friend Itai Benson, who will join us shortly. Um, Sherry, so tell us about why you wrote this book. How did you come to write a book called From Hell to Chala? And what does one have to do with the other? Okay, thanks for asking and thanks for having me. Okay. Um, I, I own a travel company called By the Sea. And together we are six women who, who run this company. And when COVID hit, it was not just a blow to all of our freedom, it was also a blow to the company. And it was really hard watching so many of our travel programs cancel, um, clients demanding refunds, cruise lines keeping commission, not giving us the commissions. And it was a lot of heartache and heartbreak. And in the meantime, I had two recent college graduates in my house and it was just a lot of anxiety for me. I have generalized anxiety anyway, so I didn't really need COVID to help me along. So you could say I was in my own hell and the the tragedy, although it ended up being an incredible catalyst for me, was spending three nights Baker acted in a mental hospital. And that made my hell worse. And I quickly, you know, we're going to read a passage from the, the mental hospital, but I quickly realized that my crazy was very different than the people who were really mentally ill. So I sucked it up and spent three days there. And when I got out, I decided I needed to leave hell which was my own hell and go on the road. So having been in the travel industry for over 20 years, I, I knew how to travel. It was just a matter of how do I travel in COVID? So I left with a carry on bag, uh, which was supposed to be like maybe a weekend or a week's long trip to see my brother. And I ended up traveling for 95 days and I traveled, this was a coincidence, but my rabbi would say there are no coincidences, but I ended up traveling to 18 different places. And I didn't realize it was 18 until I actually came home. So there's your coincidence. And I actually, I want to just shout out to my friend, Sydney, who sent me this t-shirt when I told her what the name of the book was. So anyway, my holiday. And um, that's, that's the story. And it, and it ended up being a very healing journey of staying with friends and family and clients who became my friends over the years. And it's what happened to me as I 
was on this trip I, to get rid of the anxiety, I just started baking. And I, I, so my daughter gave me a challah recipe and I tried it out. And then people along the way encouraged me to add things to the challah. So I started naming them and adding ingredients and it became like a, a big deal. And from there, I went on to cook all kinds of Jewish um, Jewish foods for my Mormon friends and my Christian friends. And it was, it, it kind of got comical along the way, but I found a way to make light or fun of the experience so that it would make for an interesting story. Cause no one really just wants to hear about your misery. They want to hear about how did you pick yourself up and move on? So right. that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So, so the baking of the challah became a therapeutic way for you to deal with whatever issues you were having. I, I'm actually really curious if you, if you, if it's not too personal, um, mm -hmm. and, and please feel free to tell me if it is, but how, what did you do that, that got you Baker acted and who was it that Baker acted you or did you do it yourself? Tell us okay. a little bit about so that. Okay, so and for those of you who don't know what the Baker Act is, could you tell them exactly sure. what the Baker Act is? So if you if you present yourself as someone who could harm themselves or someone else, the it, it's in it's a Florida thing, and they have it other places, but here it's called the Baker Act. So if you say I want to kill myself, or you say you want to hurt somebody else the police can come take you to the hospital and your rights are basically lifted from you and you will be there for 72 hours. The, the problem here was, yeah, I had wicked anxiety. My girlfriend and my kids were in the house and my son said something he probably shouldn't have said to me. And it just made me retreat to my bedroom with a bunch of pills. And I took an Ambien to go to sleep. I, I, I was just way too stressed out. And in the morning, my girlfriend came over and came in to talk to me about my son. And I was just not in the frame of mind to hear it. And I told her I wanted to die. I said, I just, I just don't want to see what happens through COVID. I don't want to live through it. I don't want to see what happens after. My business is a mess. My, my kids are a mess. My, I, it was just so much stuff and so much pressure I was putting on myself because I felt like a failure at that point. Even though it wasn't true, I felt like I was failing my company. I was failing myself. I just flipped and told her I wanted to die. And she said, if you say that again, I'm going to have to put you away in an institution. And I said, fine, I don't care anymore. Do it. So she texted her ex-husband who works for the Broward County Sheriff's Office. And he said he would come over and see me. And she said, no, or I said, no. And um, he said, all right, I'm just going to call the plantation police to check on her. But that's not what happened. So when the plantation police showed up in my bathroom with me crying on the floor, they asked me, did I say I wanted to kill myself? And I said, yeah, but I, I was having a panic attack and I didn't really mean it. And they said, well, okay, you can tell that to the psychiatrist at Plantation General. And I said, what, ha what would happen if I went there? They said, you'll be out in three hours. If you just tell them that you didn't mean it and that you're fine and you just had a panic attack, they will assess you and let you go. But that's not what happened. So I got there, they said, yeah, the police lie all the time. You're not leaving. And not only aren't you leaving, you're going to another facility. It was a, it was a, health hospital which wasn't really about health it was more about just locking you up so you can cool down and i spent three nights there in a bed with ants running all over it and no shampoo and no change of clothes and they wouldn't let me keep my bra because i could hurt myself with the underwire and there were no visitors because it was covid and it was just it was disgusting i it was just I, I can't i mean it wasn't the worst it, it, it wasn't the worst thing that could have happened. I mean, I survived COVID, but it was just, it was like, I'm a failure and now I'm in a mental hospital and it can't get any worse than this, which is how I felt. But I, th I think Karen did the right thing by sending me there because for a few reasons. Number one, I probably needed a timeout, even though I had no social media, I didn't have a phone, they stripped me of everything. But I think I needed some time just with myself. And had she not done that, I wouldn't have had a story. I would have still been in a depressed, horrible place, crying every day over the loss of, you know, business clients and freedom and everything else. So in hindsight, it was probably the best thing that could have happened. Right. And you ended up writing a book. Which I didn't intend to write. I, I did not get out of the mental hospital saying I'm going to write a book. I was actually nine chapters of travel into a 14 chapter book before I ever started to write. Wow. Yeah, and I wrote I wrote the first nine chapters in three days. I didn't sleep. 
And then I wrote the last five chapters as I was on the road. I actually finished it in real time. And the funny thing is I finished the book before I walked in the door and I had written the ending before it actually happened, but it actually happened the way I wrote it, which is really crazy. I just, I knew what was going to happen when I came home. So I wrote and it. I, and I already have a, I already have a very funny feeling that this book is going to end up being a movie. So and listen, maybe Julia Roberts could play me like she played Ellen Brockovich. Uh, <laughs> I've got Sarah Silverman on my mind, so you never know. Right. Well, there you go. I think but that's- Eat, good... Pray, Love was a movie, right? This is my Eat, Pray, Love. Right, right. That's amazing. So, so, so just so everybody who's watching now understands, sometimes the worst things that can happen in our lives end up becoming the most important crossroads that end up becoming the greatest things that happen in our lives. Um, so yeah, so that's amazing. So I would love to invite our mutual friend to join us. Um, awesome. So why don't we invite the great Broadway star, Itai Benson, to join us now. There he is. Itai, my sweet, sweet Liv. So, so Sherry, why don't you tell us very quickly how you know Itai? Well, I met, okay, so I met Itai through his mom, Itai. Itai's mentor in high school was Michael Larson. And right before Michael died, I was at a restaurant and he's telling me about this Itai Benson, this fabulous performer. I'm like, who is this kid you're so hot on? He goes, oh my God, he's amazing. He's gonna be a big star. And then I hear a voice in the back of my head saying Michael Larson. And I'm like, okay, this is really freaky. And I'm like, there's nobody in the restaurant. How would somebody, all right, forget it, right? And then a little time passes and I hear again, Michael Larson. I'm like, okay. So I look, I turn around and I see this trio of women and I'm like, Michael, I think somebody just said your name. And he goes, oh my God, I was telling you about Itai. That's his mother. So I became friends with his mom and then he died. And then I reached out to Itai to tell him what Michael said about him that night because I wanted to share it with him. And then Itai and I have spent a lot of time together over the past year. He's been down here. And it's just, yeah, I mean, so, so the worst things lead you to sometimes the best things and meeting Itai and getting to know his whole family has been the most amazing thing. Right, and I met Itai, oh, Michael was, too, so. I met Itai, he was still a teenager and Michael Larson was directing a production of Closer Than Ever, uh, this wonderful musical at the Hollywood Playhouse. And Itai came to work as, I guess, the assistant to the choreographer, um, right? Was that it, Itai? Yeah, well, we, I had done uh, a song from the musical Closer Than Ever, and Michael brought me to help, like, stage right. one of the numbers with him. Right, right. And uh, so I remember you from there. And then, of course, we got to do the great play, My Name is Asher Lev, at the Gable stage for Joe Adler, who also passed away this year. Um, and you were Usher Lev, and you were beyond brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, when I was in New York at some point, we did a great reading of my one of my favorite musicals, The Rise of David Levinsky. That's right. And you played my young Levinsky to my <laughs> older Levinsky. So Lev, Lev, Usher Lev, Levinsky, you are my young Lev. And I, I think and then you of course are I, I worked with you here on uh, the last survivor. That's right. And we worked on the last survivor together, which we will be presenting rebroadcasting for our um, Yom HaShoah commemoration events on April 7th and 8th. So we'll okay. be seeing it again on April 7th. Um, do you want to tell people very quickly, Itai, some of the work you've done on Broadway and on tour, some of the shows you've been involved in, just so everybody realizes who who we have on our program? <laughs> well, just before uh, COVID hit, I was actually um, getting ready to open uh, the revival of Stephen Sondheim's company, uh, which is coming back to Broadway. And we were nine, I think, nine performances into our previews and then... Then it was March 12th, 2020, and all of Broadway shut down. So we're still waiting for Broadway to come back, but we just received word that our show company is definitely coming back. Yeah. We don't know when yet, but it will. Um, before that, I had uh, spent about a year and a half uh, in a show called The Band's Visit on Broadway, which One was of the um, based on an Israeli film and 
you know, won a bunch of Tony awards and, and was an unlikely hit. And um, before that I had toured the country uh, playing the Oscar Levant role in an American in Paris, the stage version. And, um, and then before that, I spent a long time in a tiny little show no one's ever heard of called Wicked. Uh. I spent a few years uh, playing um, the role of Bach in Wicked all over the country and on Broadway. And so, um, yeah, so uh, I've, I've been around many stages. And then, of course, I played Asher Lev down um, in Miami with you. So. so you are an amazingly talented young man. We're very honored to have you. And oh. Sherry, I understand that uh, you've asked Itai to join us for a reason. You want to share with us what Itai will be doing for us? So a lot of the book is dialogue of people that I met along the way and th people who welcomed me into their homes. My friend Michelle who joined me in Arizona. So a lot of it is basically chapters or stories of where I went. Um, and Itai and I talked about what should we present. So we decided we would start with my stint in the mental hospital and Itai, it's very difficult to read this when you're one person because there are all these characters. So I'm playing Shari Wallach and Itai is playing every other character, um, many of them women. So just, you know, you'll know it's a woman, but um, Itai is the master of, of accents. So I, I love having him. And we're gonna start with what happened to me in the mental hospital? This is when they moved me from Plantation General to a place called the Pavilion. And I got there at 1.30 in the morning and they ushered me into a room. And what I remember about that night was there was a, there was a, a black girl in the bed next to me and she was shredding her pillow. She had her feet bandaged up and she kept telling the staff that her name was Jane Doe. So mm -hmm. we're not quite sure if it really was, but she said she was Jane Doe. So this is the next morning when I woke up. All right. Well, <laughs> okay. I'm I'm going to disappear for a little while. Okay. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is a chapter, one of the chapters, from Hell to Chala by Sherry Wallach. Okay. I woke up. Jane Doe was sitting in bed. She had false eyelashes on only one eye, bandaged feet, and a glazed look. I tried to talk to her, but I could see she wasn't playing with a full deck. I got out of bed and went to the reception desk. May I please speak to someone? I don't belong here. There's been a mistake. I need to see the psychiatrist so that I can go home. Out came Marianne, a middle-aged white lady with a kind face and a soft temperament. Hi, Miss Wallach. I'm Marianne, the nursing supervisor. Can I help you? I replied, yes, please call me Sherry. I'm not crazy. I want to go home. Mm, everyone says that, said Marianne. No one thinks they are crazy. If you try and convince anyone you are not crazy, the crazier you sound. She explained. Please wait here. She pointed to a seat inside the television room in unit three, which I came to learn was the geriatric unit. What the fuck? I sat down and waited and waited and waited for three hours. Next to me was a lady who was ready to be released. She too had told someone she wanted to kill herself, spent three glorious days at the pavilion and was supposed to get out that afternoon. She told me, regardless of what you say to the medical staff, you have been Baker acted and you will be here for 72 hours. So just get used to it and make the best of it. Three days? I'm going to be putting up with this bullshit for three days? No way. I'm going to get out of here. I can negotiate anything. I have privilege and power. I have money and status. I own a business, a house and plantation and an apartment in Manhattan. I have two cars. I have a lawyer. I have family and I have friends. Surely I can get myself out of this shithole. The psychiatrist assigned to my case, Dr. Watkins, and his stunning assistant, Sierra, came to speak with me. They never even asked me what happened. Watkins stated, You are here because you said you wanted to kill yourself. He then asked, Do you want to hurt yourself? Without hesitation, I replied, Absolutely not. They took some notes and then told me they would see me the next day. Wait, I said. I was told that all I needed to do was meet with you and then I could go home. Can I go home today? No. Watkins said. Maybe tomorrow. Ugh, seriously? Why not? I questioned. We need to make sure you are not going to hurt yourself before we let you go. He replied. I had to find a way to get through the day. I decided to see what was for lunch. There were styrofoam boxes for everyone. I took one and sat next to a lady in a wheelchair. She was alone. I decided to join her. 
Having never been inside a mental hospital, I had no idea what to expect. Was everyone a stressed out mom who had just had a lapse in judgment? I was gonna find out. I opened the lunch, fried chicken, potatoes, wilted spinach, but I was hungry and I was gonna eat it. I put some ketchup into the container. I picked up my fork and knife and cut a piece of chicken. In a monotone voice, the lady next to me said, I am cutting my chicken. I dipped a piece of chicken into the ketchup. She said, mm, I love ketchup. I put the chicken in my mouth and she said, mm, I love chicken. I am eating my chicken. Okay, Sharon, you are not crazy. This is what crazy looks like. I got up and moved to a table to sit alone. There were elderly men and women roaming the hallways. All had serious mental conditions ranging from schizophrenia to bipolar disorder to everything else you can imagine. Some were drooling. One was scooting and spinning around the hallways in her wheelchair. Another was dancing to music in her own head. It was fucked up. I asked for Marianne. Does that make me a white Karen? Marianne, I said. I, I can't handle this. Is every unit like this one? These people are nuts. I can't do it. Help me, please. She said. Okay, I have a bed in unit one. I can move you there. What is unit one? I asked. It is a higher functioning unit and the residents are much younger. She replied. Oh, okay, can I go now? I demanded gently. Yes. She confirmed. I packed up my blanket, books, and toothbrush and off I went. It had to be better over there. I walked into unit one and was greeted by the residents, starting with Big Six, a Harlem Globetrotter doppelganger. He measured six feet, seven inches, and stood there in his Captain America pajamas, glaring at me. He comes in regularly for 30 days at a time to kick a reoccurring drug habit. Then Claire, a bipolar lady in her 50s, who walked around with an inside-out blouse and black leggings, telling everyone that she loves coffee and wants to sell life insurance because... Everyone knows that bipolar people like life insurance. She frequently broke out into random conversations in French. It was beyond strange. She would tell me on the hour. I am bipolar. Did I mention that? Then there was Ashley, who had worked at, as a barista at Starbucks. She was in for taking 300 clozapine and trying to kill herself. This was not the first time she'd done this. She takes the pills and then calls the police, hoping to be dead by the time they arrived. Tragic. 19 years old. As a child, she'd been sexually assaulted by a family member. She's been living with her grandmother, who tells her she's fat and ugly and will never amount to anything. I think I'd take pills too. 18-year-old Angela was in for anger issues. There was a 23-year-old Filipino girl who was there for telling her husband she wanted to slit her wrists. The pair had a two-year-old son. And while in the pavilion, she found out that her husband had filed for divorce. It was not a good scene. Next up, Samantha, a 21-year-old EMT with a chemical imbalance and a 50-year-old gang member whose entire face was tattooed, including his scalp. I could not stop staring. His wife's name, Rachel, was inked into the right side of his face and the A was his eye. Seriously frightening. I had nightmares about him. So that was my, um, that was my, um, my entry into uh, the- Oh my God. I'm so was glad I muted myself because I was literally laughing out loud. Um, that is so great. It's such, first of all, it's fascinatingly interesting. And secondly, it's really, really funny. And yet the experience was probably horrifying. Well, I, I can tell you something my dad taught me when I was young, and, and it's probably what makes me who I am. My dad said, find the humor in everything. So I think my whole life has been find the humor in everything, even the worst situation, even a funeral. I mean, I find something that makes me laugh. And then, you know, unfortunately I haven't written down much of what's happened in my life. It's been really funny, but I think if you let tragedy get to you and if you, all you do is cry, then it's not gonna get better. And, and like my therapist and everyone should have one says you have to find a way to change the station in your brain. And part of, part of survival for me has always been to find the humor in even the most tragic of circumstances. So it's kind of how I cope, but I know it wasn't funny, but to me, it was funny. And well, I, I, you know, it is sad and I don't want to make light of mental health. Right. I find my own tragedy funny. I mean, I find the whole thing ridiculous that I, that I put myself in a situation where my girlfriend had a Baker Act me, but if I find the humor in it, it's okay. I don't think well, she, and, and, I do. 
And, and I find that to be a very Jewish trait because we laugh mm -hmm. at ourselves. We always try to find the humor in our tragedy. Um, so something occurred to me as I was listening to it. When you were writing this, it sounds like you were speaking it, but were you actually sitting and typing or were, oh. or was it more like you spoke it and kind of recorded yourself and transcribed what you wrote? Okay, How keep in mind, process? I had no phone. I couldn't speak it. So as it was happening, I kept like a, like a running memo in my head of this happened, this happened, this happened. And on the third day, when I was just, I had enough and I wanted to get out, I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna get through 24 hours. And then I said, okay. And I wrote in the, I write this in the book. I went to the reception desk and asked for paper and a pen. They gave me a golf pencil this big and one piece of paper. And I was, I was pretending, cause I work in travel, just pretend you're on a site inspection of a really bad hotel and write down every single thing you can remember. And I was writing down the dialogue in my head. Like she said this and she said that. And, I, and then, and then remember, I didn't write, I didn't start writing this book until nine chapters later. So I had these notes and I had kept them. And when I started writing the book, I'm like, oh my God, I know what happened. And I just started writing it. But a lot of the book is in dialogue. Like you'll see the other passages too. And people who have read it, have previewed it, have said to me, I can hear you in this book. Right. Because if you know me, like Itai knows me, he knows exactly what's going to come out of my mouth more than I do. But it's the it's the intonation and the crazy. And like when Itai and I were practicing this, I'm like, okay, let me explain this character to you and the way. And he takes beautiful directions. Like working yeah, well. with a professional actor is amazing because he got I'm like, no, 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 no. She would have been like really pissed off here. And like, so you'll see in the end, when we do a, um, a scene at the end where somebody who's writing to me is really pissed off and like Itai, get angry. <laughs> it's, it's fun though, because it is real. It's real people. Everything that happens in the book happened. And that's one of the reasons I think it will eventually be a movie because it was so visual at the same time. So let's tell everybody about your uh, website, which is from hell to Chala, right? Um, and here are uh, rising from fragile to fearless, one grain at a time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the photographs that we okay. are looking at now? Because right. there are so many great pictures. All right, let's start with the upper left, which is my friend Ruth. Um, so I said I was nine chapters in before I wrote it. I ended up in Jackson Hole and Ruth owns a speakers bureau. And she saw on Facebook that I was in Jackson Hall. So she called me and she said, where are you? Let's get together for lunch. And I said, okay. So we had maybe an hour together. And she said, tell me what has been going on? You know, I've been reading a little bit. Oh my God, what happened? So I started to tell her and she said, you know, you need to write the book. I'm like, I'm not writing a book. She said, no, you need to write the book. Cause then I could send you on the speaker circuit and you could tell the story. So that's Ruth, that's Jackson drug, which is not a drugstore, but it has the best huckleberry ice cream you've ever had. So this was Ruth and Jackson Hole telling me, Shari, write the book. Wow. I, I, I wonder if people know who Phil is. And who is yeah. so Phil, huh? Can you hear me? You can, right? I don't know. Okay, yes. I didn't lose you. Tell right? us, yes. Okay. So who is Phil, Phil? Rosenthal was the, nope. Phil is the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond. And we met, now my maiden name is Rosenthal. And Phil and I met through Michael Larson, um, when Michael and Phil were at Hofstra together. And it, I kind of joked with him. I'm like, oh, if I marry you, I don't have to change my name. You know, and he was 17, I was 14. And we met, but we didn't stay in touch. I mean, there was no Facebook. So anyway, years and years later, we're like, I don't want to say how many, but many, many years later, um, a mutual friend of ours and Michael's said, you know what, I'm going to reconnect you with Phil because he does this somebody feed Phil and maybe he can help you make this into a sitcom. So he agreed to talk to me and I said, if you're gonna help me, I need to send you food because everybody feeds Phil. So I first sent him challah and then I said, I'm gonna send you something really excited, ex exciting. And I sent him my grandmother's blintzes, which cost me probably $10 to make, $44 to box up with dry ice and another $50 to mail. So those are officially the most expensive blintzes ever. Yeah. And Phil agreed to review the book and, 
And um, so now I'm in touch with show. His show, I believe it's on, I believe it's on Netflix. Netflix. Um, yeah. Somebody Feed Phil. It's a travel food show where he travels and, and wow. tries food everywhere. And he's amazing and funny. And he is. And he's so funny. And he's like, Jerry, I love you. You're funny. We need to do something. So who knows and, if you become anything, but I love Phil. Phil and is you have a lot of testimonials from a lot of people. I do. I so, do. All right. So who's this guy and what's he eating? So this guy, the funniest thing here is that this guy's name is Ray. He rented, he rented us an Airbnb in, um, in Tucson. He has this quail roost ranch and um, Michelle, my friend Michelle and I, and you'll hear from her a little bit later, my friend Michelle and I decide we're gonna go stay with this guy. And we think it's him and his wife, but it turns out it's just him. And we convince ourselves that he's an ax murderer and he's gonna kill us in the middle of the night. So I decide I'm gonna cook for him because if I'm cooking and I have a spatula, he can't kill me. So um, the, we wake up in the morning, we're only there for one night, two nights, and we wake up in the morning and I'm like, Ray, we're gonna make cloud eggs. He goes, well, that's great because I have chickens outside. We can get the eggs fresh from the chicken coop. I'm like, okay. So we go and get the eggs and I teach him how to make this, which is a recipe with two ingredients. It's egg and Parmesan cheese. And I have made this for Itai and his family and they love it. So it's just, it's like, it's like poached eggs meet meringue. And it's really fun. So I got to know Ray and realized that Ray is the nicest guy on the planet. We still stay in touch. And I don't know if he's on right now, but if he is, I love you, Ray. He actually reached out to me and said, send me the link. So oh, I love him. He's, he's welcome at my house. No Airbnb charge anytime. Um, well, you want to go to the next one? Because I know there's a lot. about this challah? So about this is the challah that I baked in Idaho for my cousin's bar mitzvah. So we, we couldn't go. Obviously, it was a Zoom mitzvah. So when they cut the challah, I cut the challah with my Mormon friends. I taught them how to make challah. Wow. Wow. And yeah. uh, who's this lucky horse? Oh, the, oh, God. So I decided after I saw Ruth in Jackson Hole, I was going to go horseback riding. That is me trying to figure out how do I stop my behind from hurting? <laughs> <laughs> I had my foot stuck in the stirrup. I have neuropathy in one foot, which, of course, every Jew has a condition. I have neuropathy, and I couldn't. I couldn't maneuver my foot because I can't feel the bottom of my foot. So I don't know. My foot was dangling left and right. And I was trying to like keep my tush off the saddle. So, so how long after you were Baker acted because you wanted to kill yourself was this picture? Um, that was nine chapters in. <laughs> I don't, okay. you know, I, I, yeah, that was uh, Jackson Hole was sometime in September and I wanted to off myself in July. So I got, I got fairly happy along the way with a lot of baking. That's Grammy Esther's blintzes. Oh. Those two. <laughs> Itai has eaten everything in this, in this you Oh know. my God, I'm so hungry oh. right now. Um, I know. I'll make you the blintzes. They're in the freezer. Come on. Oh, over. good. I'd love that. Tell us about this. This looks this very was This was part of the tragic part of the trip. I was in Minneapolis and my friends took me to the George Floyd Memorial. And I, we just stood there and cried. It was it was beautifully done. It was a horrible story, but the way they memorialized him and this, which was every name of every African American person who's been killed by gun violence. There's like, you can't see the whole street, but it's a whole street of their names. Wow. And it's giving me chills just talking about it. It was just, I couldn't believe that they put this together. The whole street was, was a, has become a pedestrian mall. There's so many pictures. If you go online, you see all of the tributes to George Floyd. It's pretty um, incredible. Um, on the right. lower left, it, so you can see, well, there's another holla. But if you go down to the left, where well, you're going back up, um, I just want you to see that what my bag looked like. So that was it. Oh. That was the bag I traveled with for 95 days. Wow, that's amazing. If it, if it were my girlfriend, that would be the, the that would be the makeup bag and the blow dryer. Wow. I, I, I traveled with a pair of jeans, a few pairs of leggings, a pair of shorts and t-shirts and underwear. And I was doing laundry like every other day. Wow. Wow. Was, wow. Wow. Yeah. Really so, unbelievable. We'll go back to look at some more pictures, but I think right now, cause we're already 35 minutes into this thing. Okay. So everybody out there that's watching, we're here with our dear friend, Shari Wallach, who wrote this amazing book from hell to challah and our dear friend, the Broadway star, Itai Benson. And I think we're going to get another selection from the book. So, let this, us know this one is, what we're gonna be hearing now. This one is also tragically funny, but um, I decided to take a tour when I was, and the story is about 
the nut that was the tour director. Cool. So All he, right. he asked me my name. He asked me my name. Shari, I said. You tie? Sorry, I didn't realize we had started. Let's go back. Okay, so he asked me my name. Shari, I said. Sherry? He questioned. No, Shari. Like Shari Lewis, I said emphatically. Uh. The entirety of the tour, when he wasn't calling me sweetie or darling, he called me Shari Lewis. I wasn't going to correct him. He couldn't hear me half the time anyway. He must have those hearing aids that the US government gives VFWs for free, like the ones my 89-year-old dad has. Dad can't hear either. Off we went to Bryce Canyon. Remember that science kit we had as kids where you take handfuls of colored sand and squeeze it through your tight fists and make castles? That's exactly what the hoodoos in Bryce Canyon look like. Just imagine the sand is all red and orange with a little bit of gray on top. A marvel. I thought Yellowstone and Zion were the most incredible land formations I'd ever seen, but they were nothing compared to Bryce. I was in awe. Timmy pointed out different sand statues and told us they looked like alligators, crocodiles, Disney characters, mermaids. He got to one that featured five vertical figures. Know what that one is called? He asked. It's called Five Cowboys in the Shower, or as we like to say, Brokeback Mountain. At this point, I knew there was a lot of political incorrectness headed my way. Anyone here from New York? He asked. I am, I responded. Oh, hoo -hoo, then you might find this story offensive. He said, Timmy, you can't do much more to offend me at this point. What's the story, I asked. Well, I had a busload of New Yorkers. I explained how the canyons were formed by water, ice, and gravity. But there was this one guy who was busy on his cell phone and not paying attention. And once he was done with his call, he asked me to tell him how the Native Americans made the hoodoos. I thought... <laughs> <laughs> I am going to fix his wagon. So I told him that in the middle of the night, little engine ladies come out with tiny tools and carve it all up into these shapes when the morons are asleep. <laughs> the man had a stunned look on his face. A few minutes later, lady pulled me aside and she thanked me for putting that asshole in his place. Oh, this was going to be a long three hours. Most of us on the tour were over 50. And at one stop, Timmy said... Now, I know you old people have bladder problems, so let me know if you need to use the facilities. And the, and the piece de resistance was when he told me that he didn't realize he was a bigot until he moved to Florida. It took a move to Florida to realize this? I knew it in about five minutes. He was born in Georgia, moved to Miami, then to Cocoa Beach. He attended UF, hence the hat, and had moved from Gainesville to Utah. He had been there ever since, working as a tour guide. His final story was to tell us why we should never, we should not get out of the bus when we see a deer, especially a buck. Well, this one time I was driving a tour bus and the vehicle in front of us had a load of Orientals in it. What? Did he just say Orientals? And you know how those people are with their cameras. Well, about 50 of them got out of the bus, took out their cameras and were taking pictures of this big buck. The buck got, on, got unhappy and he started to charge at him. You've never seen so many Orientals run that quickly unless there was a big sale. Oh my God, he did not just say that. While we were driving back to the tour company parking lot, Timmy shared a few quips with us. Do you know why Utah has no crime? He asked us. No one answered. It's because everyone's got guns here. Yeah, so we... <laughs> and and yes, I was taking notes because I could have never, I could have never remembered this crap. But this guy, his real name was Jimmy. Um, I changed his name to protect the innocent. But he was, I mean, the, the guy should not have been a tour guide. And I didn't report him. I wanted to, but the stories were so ridiculous. I, I just couldn't believe this guy existed. But Utah and a lot of ex-president supporters and a lot of guns. So it was. It awakening but again it's it's you know there's it's tragic but at the same time it's hysterically mm. funny and to me that's what makes great literature it's what makes great television it's what makes great theater is that you can see both sides of the coin sometimes and recognize the truth you know, we may not want to speak about it. We may not want, we may want to be politically correct, 
But you know what? There are plenty of people I know who talk just like that and say really, really terrible things. Um, and we can't deny that it exists. So I really appreciate um, that you were willing to, to put it in your book. Um, well, Itai's got him down. I mean, Itai has never met him. Well, right. no one's seen a picture of him, but um, yeah. So well, there's well, us, a good morning, us about, Sunday. About, you know, who's this? Well, okay, let, let's, there, there he is. That's him. Oh, that is that's Timmy. Him. That's wow. him. And I was like doing this like thumbs up thing to take the picture. And as the guy, and I was smiling, and this guy just puts his arms around me. I'm like, ah, <laughs> that's him. There yep. he is. And and now suddenly it all makes sense. Yeah, he was. The, he was everything the you just said looks exactly like him. And Itai, so. this is the first time Itai seeing the picture, I think. Oh but, wow! Um, it was it was like yeah, exactly like Itai did it, and and just the fact that it actually happened because the truth is stranger. Is way oh, so that's my friend Lane. He um, he he and his parents let me stay with them in Salt Lake City, and that's where I started to write the book at their house. Wow! And they were they were they were great audience members for me because I kept reading the parts to them, like we love that, we love that. So he's in the book. Um, the Mormons loved my not today Satan sweatshirt, and if I could have sold them, I would have sold quite a few of them. That is my friend Michelle. We hot air ballooning because we could. And I, that's the chapter that I call Fearless, where I just do everything crazy, like hot air balloon ride and get a tattoo and all kinds of other stuff. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's amazing. So once again, you were Baker acted because you were threatening to kill yourself. You were so depressed, mm -hmm. so over life, and you ended up having the trip of a lifetime with this one little bag. Yeah, with this one little bag. And That's I did, amazing. Like I, said, oh. I never intended it to be a long trip. It was supposed to be a week. Right, right, right. Amazing. So let's uh, tell us some more. Tell us, what's this? So let's see, where are we going? Oh, that's a that's a kid in Idaho. Okay, the salt gun is hysterical. After they showed me the AR-15s in their upstairs bedroom, and I kind of freaked out, I said, I, I can't, I can't shoot a gun. And my friend handed me this. And she goes, you could shoot this. This is a salt gun that kills mosquitoes. And I was like, okay. So I started shooting every mosquito in their house with the ridiculous salt gun. I didn't look my best. I look like a crazy woman. But how, how do you kill a mosquito with a salt gun? It's salt charged. There's like a cat, like a salt, something capsule in it. And you aim it and you just shoot it. And it goes, and it kills the mosquitoes. <laughs> I've never seen one. I've never heard of a mosquito killing salt gun it exists i'm i'm here to tell you okay if nothing else oh, your yeah. book is going to change the world of mosquito killing because everybody I, I hope so. to buy a salt gun. all right what is this now so there's there's a story to the shower but you have to go to the tent picture first so i can explain that so this is the shower at the zion's view campgrounds where i went glamping because uh -huh. i needed a lamp because I just, you know, fearless. I needed to go glamping. I don't know if there's, I know there's a picture somewhere. Oh, uh, there's more food. I don't see it's it. It's all my little, do you nope. see a picture of a campsite? Well, we don't. No, I don't think it's on this. Is there a campsite? No campsite? I well, I ended up, I ended up going glamping near Zion. And I will just cut the story short, but I ended up falling while I was using the facilities outside. And I got up and went to walk back to the tent and fell into the sandstone bottomless. And then I, went, I was like, oh my God, I have to go take a shower. And then I, I waited till the sun came out and I was like all happy with my shampoo and my, my towel to go take a shower until I realized that this was the shower and I was not getting naked in it. So oh. I closed back on my sandstone body and went to a hotel that my friends were staying at and used their shower. Is that I mean you can only rough it to a degree uh, right. yeah that that was no that was not happening that was definitely not happening and I assume so then you can this, see my this is your see, new tattoo my new tattoo oh yeah that's my so the tattoo is the logo from my company by right. the city. and I knew I didn't know what the company would be like when I came home it could have been completely gone but I decided that the company would always be a part of me even if I wasn't a part of it so I tattooed the logo. I mean, again, something I would have never done. Wow. But kids are like, mom, you told us to never get a tattoo. Now you can't 
buried in a Jewish cemetery. I'm like, whatever, whatever. Um, if you read the book and you'll learn about Sandy and the post office experience and Scallywag, my friend's dog, who had no personal boundaries. And, and it was just a lot of fun. I'm glad and, I took all the pictures I took. And this soup? No, that's short ribs Provençal, or Nisoise, or whatever it is. I don't know. Ribs Provençal. Short ribs yet? Wow. Or just the brisket. Oh my God, look at this. What is this? An ATV? Yeah, I went on it. So I went to the Coral, Coral Sands Dune in um, outside of Bryce, and it's like the largest, most spectacular dunes in the United States. So we went ATVing and it was fun. I met up with some friends. I had a lot of people I met up with along the way. And the picture next to it is Minneapolis. It's Mary Tyler Moore. Right. And I was singing, you know, you can turn the world on with a smile. I'm like, I'm going to smile through this and get through it. My, so my favorite, it at the top of my, lungs. my favorite Mary Tyler Moore moment is actually in a 1969 movie called Thoroughly Modern Millie. You all know oh, Thoroughly yeah. Modern Millie. But they made a movie. And in the movie, yeah. Julie Andrews sings the wedding song in Yiddish. I'm sorry. She actually, Julie Andrews actually sings the entire wedding song in Yiddish. And in the <laughs> middle of the song, this is true. And in the middle of the song, there's a cut to Mary Tyler Moore who turns to her friends and looks at the camera and says, it's Jewish. And that's my favorite Mary Tyler Moore story. So everybody, this is Hallelujah, man, from hell right. to challah, um, hallelujah. by Sherry Wallach. Um, it sounds like an amazing book. When does it come out, Sherry? So it, it officially comes out July 13th. It's being printed next month, probably overseas somewhere. Um, it can be pre-ordered on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, either by going to my website and clicking on order or just going directly to those outlets. Um, I, anybody who's in Florida that, that gets a book, I'll happily sign it. And I'm going to be all over the country. I bought a, I bought a, a conversion van. So I'm going to go back to the places where I found the story. I'm going to go back and share you know, what happened since and sign some books. And oh, yes, yeah, so really great. If not, yeah. That's great. You want to read a, a last section yeah. for us? This one, this one's tough. This one is tough. So um, I'll set it up for you. So um, I went to Minnesota and I was hanging out with some friends who took me to Tofty up by Lake Superior, like all the way by Canada. And I was staying in there. They have a like a timeshare townhouse on the lake. So I was staying with them and I was starting to feel I was starting to feel pretty good. And then I'll read it. My time in Minnesota had come to an end. I was sad to leave, but eager to face my next adventure. I was feeling better and more alive. My anxiety and depression were tapering off, but I was at odds with my parents and not quite sure where I stood with my children. I was keeping my distance for fear of saying something that would completely ruin any of those relationships. I just didn't want to be controlled or told what to do. Spending time with friends and avoiding difficult conversations had been a good, healthy escape. I was posting my adventures on social media for anyone who wanted to see what I was doing. I had shared my frustrations with a trusted relative, whom I also consider a close friend. I told her that I was happy with the distance, both physically and emotionally. And then I received this email. Sherry, if you do not want to get upset, don't read this. The easiest way to get my attention. You are not going to like what I am about to say. Sorry. I may not like it, but I'm gonna see what you have to say. No one wants to be judged, disrespected, or reprimanded. It appears your kids are unhappy with you and you are unhappy with them. You are unhappy with your parents. What, should everyone just pull a Jeffrey to be happy? She had just thrown in Jeffrey. That was low. My overly sensitive middle child syndrome brother went to school to become a psychologist, analyzed our entire family, and disappeared with his wife and two daughters decades ago. He never tried to work it out. He abandoned everyone. Running away is a temporary fix. And at some point you have two choices, eliminate everyone who causes stress in your life or suck it up because people don't change and they don't appreciate your critical analysis of them. They do not have to be who you want them to be. I wonder, hmm, you have a difficult relationship with your family, but a marvelous relationship with outsiders. Spend the, the rest of your life cooking and baking for strangers. Really, Sherry, get real. 
I guess you can run away forever. Keep putting your pictures on Facebook for love and validation or go home and try to find some way to cope. No one wants to talk to you. So are they making you more miserable or are you making them more miserable? This is a horrible situation. And it appears you must stop filling your time and escaping into things that will not matter and get back to things that will. You may be traveling, but you are really, really lost. And I'm sorry to get you upset. And I know that you're looking for love and supports. It hurts me to send this. Still love you. Initially, I was shocked at what she had to say. I knew she loved me and it must've been hard to send that message. Was she right? Was I running? Was I the problem? Should I go home and fix everything? Wait, this was the best I had felt in years. I wasn't crying, I was thriving. I was not being controlled or controlling anyone else. I was seeing this spectacular country on my own terms. I was taking me time. I would faced my fears of traveling alone. I would faced my anxiety of driving by myself for more than an hour or two. This journey was exactly what I needed. So um, yeah, that was a tough one. And there were, more, there were more emails back and forth. And you know, I, I guess that's the way she felt. And I saw it completely differently and in a way I, if I hadn't got that message, maybe I would have come home. But that like affirmed for me, like, fuck you, I'm going. I mean, I am, I'm, you're not going to tell me to come home. So, you know, it's all part of the story. And I'm not mad at this relative because, you know, I, I mean, it, it was what that person needed to tell me and maybe what I needed to hear to keep me pursuing what I was pursuing. So all good. So I'd like you to tell us, Sherry, if, if you had to give advice to young people today who might be having trouble dealing, um, what would you tell them? Based on your experiences, you've just written a book all about this terrible experience you had that turned into this incredible experience. How, what would you say to young people today? Because listen, we have to admit, we've just, we've been living through a hellish period. Yep. COVID yep. changed the world, everybody's world. You know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. What would you tell young people today who are having trouble dealing? First, I would say, there's a few things. First, I would say, be kind to your parents. Because <laughs> there's you no, know, I would, because, you know, it's easy for my kids. To, yes, please, please. And, and be, be kind to your parents. I mean, I've been extra kind to my parents since I came home, realizing that, hey, they did the best they could. There's a lot of things in the book that happened in my childhood that were really awful. And I could blame my parents, but you know what? They, they, they did the best they could. They functioned, they survived, and I'm not dead. You know, they, they did an okay job. With, with my own kids, I know they want so much from me and they judge me for everything I do. And, I, and I, I've said this to my own kids, be kind. Be kind to yourselves and be kind to your parents because you only get one shot at, at this, right? Um, I would also say that I think everybody needs a therapist and not because we're all crazy, but it helps to talk to, so Itai's smiling, he's been kind of my armchair therapist a little bit because Itai, could be somewhat um, unbiased because he wasn't with me as a child. So I could share things with him that bothered me and he was a good sounding board for me. So even if it's not a therapist, if it's somebody who can be unbiased, talk about what's going on. Don't let it bubble up to the point where you are saying, I wanna die. And, and the thing about, I mean, I've thought in my life, I wanna die, I wanna kill myself, I wanna take pills and not wake up. I've had moments you know, in my life. And what I realize is tomorrow, don't, this is what my, my friend Amy said to me, don't quit on your worst day. That's the piece of advice. Because if today's your worst day, tomorrow will be better. Don't quit because it will get better. And I remember talking to Itai when he lost his dad and he was so like, I'll never be happy again. And I said, you will, you will be happy again. And we both cried our eyes out because his father was a very close friend of mine. And I'm like, it will get better. I, you're never going to get over it, but we will get through it. We're all going to get through it. And in the course of before I cracked up completely, I was spending every day with Itai, his mom, his now wife, um, his brother, because I didn't know how to get out of my own skin. I was so upset. And I was watching them be upset over losing a family member. And here I was being upset over a business. Like, so what? That's not really that important. But to me, it was. So everything that happens, you're going to think is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And then time goes by and you just do. Like I said to Itai, just do something. And, and, and his mom, Teva, like, just do something to 
take your mind off of it, even though you're going to go right back to it, do something. So I took my own advice and I did. So that's my, my advice is don't give up on your worst day, do something to change the wiring and get someone to talk to. Even if it's not a therapist, get somebody who can coach you a little bit. Right. I was going to say, you know, the idea that you have to speak to somebody, you have to have somebody to talk to. Um, and Itai, I'm so sorry about your dad. It was such a shock. And he was such a beautiful man. Um, and, and we all loved him. And what a horrible, horrible loss. But, you know, what I find amazing today in the world, and especially here in the United States of America, is that we elected a president who has lost. He understands loss he and does. empathy and sympathy. You know, forget the politics, whether you like him or you don't like him, Democrat or Republican, that's not even the issue. The issue mm -hmm. is we have lost 550,000 Americans to COVID. Every single person I know personally, well over a dozen people who've died. Um, and, and everybody I know knows someone who knows someone who was affected, who lost no. someone. And we are living in a period where we have to deal with loss and we have to deal with how do you overcome the, the loss? How do we overcome the depression? How do we overcome the horror of feeling like what's the point of living? And it's and it seems to me, ladies and gentlemen, those of you watching right now on all three of our platforms, that this book from Hell to Chala by Sherry Wallach may be a great way to overcome whatever might be ailing you at the moment. And I hope that everybody goes and pre-orders your book. Uh, Sherry, do you want to say anything before I let you guys go? Itai? I do want to say that the book is dedicated to Itai's dad. Oh, because uh, he was such a special person in our lives. And I, I hope that um, I, I'm going to donate some of the proceeds of the book. I have to make I sell a lot of copies before I can do that. But right. um, women and trans black trans women who really are at the bottom of the of the scale, the social scale. So I'm hoping that in, in selling this book and sharing the story, I can actually help some people who really have challenges and can't afford therapy and can't don't have someone to talk to. So I want to say that. And I want to thank Itai for taking the time to do this with me. I, it's the first thank time you. I've been a Broadway star. So that was great. And Avi, um, I love you. And I'm so thrilled that Michael brought us together. I mean, sometimes the people who leave, leave you with the greatest gifts. And Michael left me with you and Itai and so many others. So I'm really, really grateful. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Itai. I love you. Sherry, I love you too. I'm very grateful to both of you for joining me. And I'm going to let you guys go and I'm going to say goodbye to my to my viewers. Um, and so thank you, people. Go to the website from helltohala.com. Is that what it is, Sherry? Yeah, yeah. From helltohala.com from helltohala.com and go pre-order this incredible book. Um, ladies and gentlemen, once again, schmoozing with Avi. In case you missed the beginning, I look like a vampire right now because I just spent 10 hours in a boxcar on my way to Auschwitz. Um, I'm filming a movie called Boxed. It's a beautiful movie that has English and Yiddish and it's all about a, a couple of Holocaust survivors who um, are sent to Auschwitz and they survive because they dance and their dance saves them in the camp and eventually uh, out of the camp after, they're, um, uh, after they are liberated. Um, we are whyilovejewish.org. I hope you will go to our website and see the work we do. Every Tuesday, I interview people I love uh, interesting stories, amazing things. Um, and so I hope you'll watch us every Tuesday. On March 30th, we're doing a special 
Passover and Interfaith Perspective, a panel discussion with some amazing uh, interfaith personalities um, from, from all over the country. Uh, we have from the Baha'i faith and the Muslim faith and the Christian faith, the Jewish faith, the historical perspectives. Uh, so I hope you'll join us on March 30th. April 7th and 8th, we're doing two days of Why I Remembers Yom HaShoah. And we will be featuring our, our favorite, one of our favorite authors, uh, actor, actors and directors, Eleanor Risa, will be doing two of her pieces, as well as a premiere, I guess, on Zoom of a project called Signs of Life. Uh, it's a musical project, and it's all about the Theresien concentration camp and what happened after the camp and it's after the war. Uh, it's a beautiful piece. Please go to our website, whyilovejewish.org. We bring you all of our programming for free. So if you enjoy our work, if you enjoy the things we do, please consider supporting our work. Go to whyilovejewish.org slash donate and obviously become part of our mishpoche. So we love you a lot. Thank you for watching. And um, please, you can contact us anytime, info at whyilovejewish.org. And hopefully I'll see you very, very soon. Thank you again. Bye-bye.